Pegasus, que diz que ele fala sobre o texto de Tessia e do Cisco, que é o único instituto de ensino lá. E me é Brandon Burke, professor em nós de Atlantis do Instituto. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Canadian Institute in Greece. Uh, this is our annual open meeting here at the Danish Institute. We are very grateful for the use of their facilities. Uh, I am Brendan Burke, Interim Director. Uh, I have the honor of presenting a short report tonight on the work of our Institute, and then I will introduce our uh, featured speaker. Uh, our work, of course, <clears throat> our work, of course, uh, would not be possible without the support of the Ministry of Culture and Sport. Uh, Secretary General Dr. Maria Andre Daki Blasaki, Director of the General Directorate of Antiquities, Dr. Polixeni Adam Veleni, and the former Director Dr. Elena Korka, the Director of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities, and its Director Dr. Elena Pandori, the Director of Byzantine and Post Byzantine Antiquities, Dr. Susanna Julia Capoloni, the Director of the Department of Foreign Schools, Dr. Constantina Benisi, and Mrs. Tina Garbelli. Uh, and we are very grateful for their help. Uh, we are also very grateful to the many members of the Archaeological Service uh, working in the various efforts and museums throughout Greece uh, who have contributed so much to research by Canadian scholars and students. Uh, in Greece. The Canadian Institute in Greece is made up of many contributing researchers, students, and supporters based in Canada. Uh, and we are very sad to note the passing of two distinguished supporters, Michael Burke Walbank who passed away in May last year. Michael took his PhD at the University of British Columbia, focused on the inscriptions stored in the Stowe of Atlas basement, which became the subject of many of his publications. On his retirement from the University of Calgary, uh, he and his wife Mary returned to live outside Victoria on Vancouver Island. The death of David Jordan in September was a very sad occasion for all who knew him. He was a native of Georgia, uh, in the United States, and David was the epitome of the soft-spoken Southern gentleman. He was an authority on ancient magic and Greek curse tablets, and his opinion was regularly sought on a wide variety of topics in epigraphy, philology, and ancient religion. Together with John Trail, the two organized the conference Lettered Attica at the Canadian Institute in March 2000. David was a lover of both ancient and modern Greece, and it was here in Athens that he lived with his wife Jan, both are well known for their kindness and generosity to all. David, of course, ran the Institute from 1996 to 2000 at a critical time in its history. And for those of you who may not be familiar fully with the, Institute of, with the history of the Canadian Institute in Greece, formerly the Canadian Archaeological Institute in Athens, Kaya, um, our institute was founded in February of 1976 so that Canadian scholars could conduct research in Greece. In 1980, uh, with the support uh, from the Canadian Embassy and the Greek Ministry of Culture, the first office was established on Gennadiou Street in central Athens. Here you can see it here. Uh, this was the former uh, Canadian Embassy, and the CIG, or the CAIA, was housed in it for a time. By 1995, uh, with generous private donations, the CIG was able to purchase permanent facilities on Dionysio Egenitu where it is currently housed, uh, the library, lecture space, and office, all in one building. So we move from uh, here all the way to here on Dionysio Megany 2 Street. Uh, here we have our hostel as well on the floor above. Uh, the space is good, but as many of you may know, the lecture room is especially limited. That's why we're here at the Danish Institute tonight. Uh, in 2017, the CIG purchased a significant uh, building in the heart of Athens at Ormenu Street, uh, number three, which you can see here, down here. So we made a loop, basically, <laughs> for your orientation. The move is expected to start later this year so that we can host uh, next year's open meeting in our own building for the first time. This new building is under renovation under the supervision of the Institute's Assistant Director, Jonathan Tomlinson, on top of all the other things he's doing for us, and our architect, Soterius Soteriakos. Uh, and you can see some of the, the building on the right and read some reconstructions. The three-story building has a large open rooftop that will provide much-needed space for the CIG's popular lectures and its growing library. Here you can see under work, the lecture hall, and with some imagination, this is what it will be like uh, next year. Um, 
To increase awareness of the CIG and to help raise funds in part for our new building, I traveled to Ottawa, Montreal, and Toronto earlier this winter on behalf of the CIG. Our board met with the Hellenic Heritage Foundation in Toronto, as you can see here on the slide on the left, uh, and uh, other interested parties uh, per, uh, attended uh, my short uh, speaking tour. Our speaker also hosted me at the Royal Ontario Museum too, and I appreciate that. In terms of activities and publications, this past year the CIG was pleased to participate in the Philoxeni Archaeologia Conference and Exhibition, which marked the European Year of Cultural Heritage in 2018. The event was held in October at the Acropolis Museum. Jonathan and I co-authored a paper, The Canadians to Increase Social and Cultural Activities that Engage with the Past and the Present. The Institute also saw the edited volume by Sheila Campbell of her excavation at the Cistercian Monastery of Zaraka. This unique site lies in the valley of ancient Stymphalus in Arcadia, near the modern village of Stymphalia. It dates to the early 13th century, from the time of the Fourth Crusade when the Franks controlled large parts of the Peloponnese. This is the best preserved Frankish monastic site in Greece, and this publication makes, makes a significant contribution to this important period of Greece's history. The Institute also hosted a series of lectures throughout the autumn and winter, and here are some of the uh, images from those lectures and our featured speakers. We thank them all for their contributions. Uh, these talks were successfully uh, coordinated by our Institute's director, Jonathan Tomlinson, ably assisted by our PhD fellow, Barbara Scarfo of McMaster University, UC, who is also a speaker, our final speaker of the season, uh, and our interns, Heather Robinson in the fall, Mara Spelly in the winter, and currently we have Monica Santos with us from York University. In addition to the lecture series, we try to promote aspects of Canadian culture in Greece, including hosting a film series in the fall and winter, as you can see the titles on the screen. Uh, and we are very grateful to the Canadian Embassy uh, to Greece, who sponsored a CIG board member, Dr. Allison Glazebrook. She gave a very popular series of lectures in Athens focused on working women and female labor in classical Athens. Um, and this was at the uh, Acropolis Museum and elsewhere. So we very much appreciate our collaboration with the Canadian Embassy. They are constant supporters of us. Uh, beginning in January, although the CIG does not have a formal academic program. Um, for three months, the Institute was home to nine Canadian undergraduate students on a semester abroad program sponsored by my university, the University of Victoria, and it was directed by me. <laughs> <laughs> they took regular courses, uh, earned a full semester of credit, and were able to see many different parts of Greece. Uh, and they called Athens home. <laughs> very happy to be able to share the city of Athens with these students, um, as I did as an undergraduate. It's not easy to do, and I would encourage my colleagues to consider these um, opportunities as full semester programs that might be possible here in Greece. Finally, for my part of tonight's talk, I will present a, a short overview of CIG-affiliated uh, projects throughout Greece. Uh, what follows are short summaries from the directors of five projects moving in chronological order and roughly from south to north. Uh, so we'll go to um, Stelida on Naxos, ancient Elion in Boeotia, uh, we'll go to the western Argolid, uh, then to Thessaly, and then we will conclude our tour uh, in northern Greece at Arginos. So Dr. Tristan Carter of McMaster University and Dimitris Athanasoulis, the director of the Cycladic Aburia, report the following on the Stelita Naxos archaeological project, aka SNAP. Uh, the summer of 2018 saw SNAP undertake its fourth season of a five-year fieldwork program. The double-peaked hill is a natural source of chert, a silica-rich stone that was used to make tools in early prehistory, that is, before the advent of metallurgy. While the obsidian of Mil nearby Milos is better known uh, as a lithic resource in Aegean prehistory, the chert of Stelida is a more robust material that would have allowed those exploiting it to make axes and butchery tools, as well as cutting tools and projectile tips. The project has claimed that the site is mainly Paleolithic in date, visited by early Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, and earlier hominins, its last phase of use being Mesolithic around 9,000 years ago. While this season saw an increased uh, emphasis on post-excavation and analysis 
A certain amount of fieldwork continued on the upper flanks of this deleted church source. Uh, the excavation focused on completing the most important sondages uh, from the previous seasons. And this work was taking place, took place in two main areas. Uh, this was an important area, the area of the southwest at the highest peak was important because uh, it was here that significant quantities of diagnostic middle, middle paleolithic tools had previously been recovered. These include products of the level of law and dispoidal core technologies, a type of tool making that in Greece is associated with the Neanderthal populations. Um, so I'm ahead of myself. One of these soundages, uh, Trench 3, is situated close to the church outcrops at a steep part of the hill, where over the millennia, substantial amounts of hill wash or colluvium have accumulated through erosional processes, with the redeposition of thousands of stone tools and their manufacturing debris. Trench 3 has now been excavated over all four seasons and still has yet to reach natural surface, with these colluvial deposits now over four meters deep. The schematic stratigraphic section to your left uh, reflects the different depositional events with the wavy lines representing periods of stability when true soils and surfaces developed. These cycles of erosion and stability are thought to reflect climate changes within the Ice Age with warmer interglacial periods likely producing more rain, which would have resulted in greater erosion. Halfway through the 2018 season, it was necessary to expand the sondage from its original 2x2 configuration to a 2x4 uh, size for health and safety reasons. The project's geoarchaeologists, Paniotis Parkanis and Justin Holcomb of the American School of Classical Studies, have been attempting to connect all of these trenches' stratigraphic profiles, and then, working with colleagues from Bordeaux University, have been taking samples for scientific dating using a technique called optically stimulated luminescence dating. They have just submitted our, their first publication on this work and hope to share these results uh, via the CIT website course. One of the big problems faced by the Stilita team is that the highly alkaline soils means that organics almost never survive, so no bone and no plant materials. This makes it very difficult to reconstruct the Paleolithic environment and what people were eating and what they were doing near the quarries. In 2018, the team, team began a research program dedicated to this problem with Tyler Murchie of the McMaster Ancient DNA Lab taking soil samples within which he hoped to have genetic traces of the organics, including potentially the people that were present on the site. So this is a very new form of ancient DNA studies, using soils rather than bones to extract the DNA. But the initial results, uh, SNAP reports, suggest that the significant genetic traces do indeed remain in some of the deposits. Uh, Stelita is a very rare type of site in that it embodies an extremely deep time history that allows us to compare the behavior of early Homo sapiens and their ancestors in exactly the same place. Uh, very few Paleolithic quarries have been studied. Most are more restricted in their time depth. The obsidian source of Buuda in central Anatolia being a notable exception, being exploited from the lower Paleolithic to the late Bronze. Um, and in conclusion, as a means of comparing the actions of prehistoric populations, the team has been undertaking a more detailed geological characterization of the raw materials, uh, working with Tim Kinnaird and Anna Klein of St. Andrews University. Their work has distinguished five main types of shirt of church at Stelita. Data from that, when integrated with the artifact studies, allows the team to consider raw material choices through time. Preliminary studies suggest a clear pattern for the Neanderthals and earlier hominids using a more sandy and tougher chert for the northern part of the quarry, while Homo sapiens uh, of the upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic used a finer quality blue chert uh, from the southern outcrops. So, moving to mainland Greece, um, here we are in central Greece. This is the Eastern Boeotia Archaeological Project, uh, which is directed by Alexander Harami of the Effort of Antiquities of Boeotia. Brian Burns of Wellesley College, and myself from the University of Victoria. Our project began in 2007 with a surface collection survey in tilled fields immediately below a natural outcrop of limestone in the village of Arma, about 14 kilometers east of Thebes. This is the archaeological site we identify as ancient Elion, located at the center of the agricultural plain extending from Thebes uh, to the uh, Euboean Gulf. <coughs> The first excavations ever at ancient Elion began in 2011 and continued until last year. 
Results thus far from the excavated hilltop shown here have revealed three major phases from the prehistoric and classical eras. In the early archaic uh, period, Bronze Age remains at the site were sometimes reused and refashioned. Uh, we also have the significant construction of a monumental polygonal wall in the late 6th century. Uh, it is also from this period and the succeeding classical uh, levels uh, that we have the majority of our evidence for cult activity. Much of that is concentrated around this uh, threshold block. Um, here you can see in blue, these are the Mycenae remains, and in orange, this is the archaic and classical. Um, here you can see some of our students excavating miniatures and figurines, which you see here. These are, uh, are for us, uh, indicators of cult action. Uh, lower down in the soil, we have excavated late, Myc a late Mycenaean settlement, um, dating from both the palatial period, LH3A to B, and into the LH3C post-palatial age. During this time, we understand Elion to be a secondary center uh, within the administrative network centered at Thebes, um, but activity at the site is strong also in the post-palatial period as well, suggesting a shift in network ties to sites along the UV and Gulf. So here we are moving down in time from palatial to post, or post-palatial to palatial. You can see some of our figurines for cult activity, um, also our Jewelry mold, uh, made, used probably for making uh, glass beads, perhaps like this, perhaps similar to ones from the Cadmium at Thebes. Um, but our most recent work is concentrated on and within an enclosure which we call the blue stone structure, so called because of the polished blue stone limestone that capped uh, parts of the delimitating wall. This structure was capped with a mound of clay marking an early Mycenaean cemetery of some significance dating to the formative period of Mycenaean society uh, in the 17th century. Eleven tombs have been found inside the BSS and several more along the exterior. Uh, most striking are the two standing graves ceiling, which you can see here. So you can see the living by these fourth estate blocks that mark the, uh, the BSS. Uh, one tomb in particular will uh, we can focus on very briefly to give you an idea of what our, these tombs are like. Here you can see some of the ones in the north. This is also some of the digital modeling that uh, my colleagues at, from uh, at Wellesley College are working on. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an impressive way, I think, to show the aspects of the site with visual. So you can see some of the tombs here. We'll visit tomb 10 there. Um, tomb 10 provides a good example for the tombs. The remains of three individuals are well articulated, especially the last person interred, estimated to be about 12 years old. This individual was found with three necklaces, a beaded bracelet, and a minion cup. Other grave goods in the tomb included two unfired cups in the, or pots in the northwest corner of the tomb, which are unusual to us. Uh, pieces of wood were also found heavily degraded, as well as many fragments of woven textiles. Uh, this also is unusual. Two other individuals who appear to be male and in their mid-twenties were positioned against the eastern side of the chamber. Ceramics from this tomb and others uh, in the BSS and outside uh, suggest a date from between 1700 to 1600, the formative age of the Mycenaeans. And these are also some of the uh, beads and seal stone that we found uh, last year. Moving to the Arcolid, WARP, the Western Arcolid Research Project, conducted its second study season last year. This project is co-directed by Scott, Gall Scott Gallimore, Sarah James, and Dimitri Nikasis. WARP is a diachronic archaeological survey of the upper Inacos River Valley in the region of the modern villages of Lerkia, Skinokori, and Sterna in the northeastern Peloponnese. The project's overarching research goal is to understand the shifting relationship in time between the communities of the Western Arcolid and the larger interregional networks of the Northeast Peloponnese. Over 8,000 units were investigated over in these past study seasons. Um, one of the features, that, one of the areas that they've been exploring is the idea of uh, redating some of their uh, deposits. The analysis has recognized, for example, much more Mycenaean material than had been identified in their initial readings and some of the medieval material has been now assigned to uh, late Ottoman and early uh, modern periods. And the project thanks Kim Shelton and Guy Sanders for assisting with that work. The fortifications of the Argolid are a two-year project in cooperation with the effort of antiquities of the Argolid um, and the directors of war. Uh, they are documenting uh, with, through photography, architectural drawing, and topographic mapping 
uh, an area uh, adjacent to their uh, survey zone. The project's research goal is to report previously known but poorly documented sites in the Western Hardwood in order to put the intensive survey results into a wider context and to contribute to the protection of known archaeological sites in the Argonne. Moving to another Castro site, Margaret Hogsman and Sophia Carapano report on their activities at Castro Calithea up in Thessaly. Uh, this is a synergia between the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sport, represented by the effort of Antiquities in Larissa, and the Canadian Institute in Greece, represented by the University of Alberta. The team would like to thank the municipality of Farsala, Mayor Aris Kalios, municipal archaeologist Vaso Nula, and the citizens of Kalithea, Narthaki, and Farsala, Farsala for their hospitality and support. In 2018, the team was able to finish the documentation and cataloging of all material from the, derived from the excavation and survey. The bulk of recent material comes from Building 10, a large domestic structure dating to the Hellenistic period. Tens of thousands of shirts represent more than 400 individual vessels. The additional textile equipment, figurines, metal, glass, stone, uh, all give an impression of Building 10's uh, use and function. At the request of the effort's director, Dr. Stavroulis Stradoli, uh, the team worked towards an exhibition on the results of the Castro Calithea archaeological project in the Diachronic Museum in Larissa. This is a stunning museum opened in 2015, uh, and its exhibition room is professionally designed, spacious, well lit. Um, the exhibition, Castro Calipea Visualizing Life, Visualizing Life in an Ancient City, took place from the 1st of February to mid-May in 2018. And it was funded through a grant uh, acquired by the Diachronic Museum for, from the Ministry of Culture for 20,000 euros. The exhibit featured 138 artifacts on display. Team members designed some of the uh, panels and text that went along with them. There was a PowerPoint. Uh, there were 3D reconstructions by Alberta students here, at one student named Sam Glover, uh, that were printed out and also put on display. A scaled down 1 to 2 version of Building 10 was laid out on the floor, which you can make out here. Um, so it was an interesting way for visitors to engage with the archaeological remains. Uh, the, the, and the material was placed in the spot where it was found, including this bathtub, the stamnos with a sacrifice of a heart, uh, etc. Um, at the exhi exhibition in Larsa, the material was brought to Farsala, and after the exhibition in Larsa, and brought to Farsala and put on display in the cultural center with a festive opening ceremony on July 23rd. Uh, this was where the exhibition will be staying until Farsala's new building for the city's archaeological collection will be finalized. The Castro Calithea archaeological project has come to an end, but work will continue focusing on the landscape surrounding this site. The goal of the new Central Ikea Theotis Survey, or CAPS, is to work towards a better understanding of the environmental setting of the urban community at Castro and other communities. The intention is to study the potential of natural resources and development of cultivation practices uh, in this area and also explore trade routes and other networks. Um, and finally, Jacques Perrault of the University of Montreal and Zizis Bonias report the following on their work at Archives. Uh, in 2018, uh, the excavation uh, at Ancient Argolos, the team numbered nearly 70 people with students from North American universities, Europe, Australia, and Japanese universities as well. Um, all of them contributed to this very successful campaign. All efforts were devoted to the excavation of a shop complex L at the adjoining H and the adjoining HP and Q buildings. Also explored was an area to the northeast of these buildings below the southeast sector to verify the possible extension of a large street uncovered during the excavations done in this area some years ago. In the Kukulis, uh, Luby sector, Building H, the excavation of seven of the twelve rooms uh, of this building took place. The rooms near the center of the building have suffered greatly from modern occupation in this area. In some rooms, a relatively thick layer of ashes containing rifle bullets dating from the Second World War are witness to the presence of the German army temporarily stationed here. This recent occupation, added to agricultural work in the area since the late 1970s, damaged the ancient levels which in this area was very close to the modern surface. 
Some walls have completely disappeared, as well as the latest occupation levels. Luckily, though, these are well preserved in other rooms of the building where they date to the first half of the 4th century. The preliminary results of the work done in these rooms suggest that the central part of building H suffered uh, already in antiquity. A thick fill made up of virgin soil was placed over the earlier levels to serve as a substratum of the 4th century BC floors, of which only a few traces remain. Despite these somewhat disappointing results, they were able to determine the internal divisions of the wall uh, of the rooms, from which, like the others in this building, have internal walls separating each room into two or three units. Room H11 is in better state of conservation and revealed a few interesting structures. The excavators uncovered along the east wall of the room, towards the center, the base of a metallurgical furnace in use during the first half of the century. The base is well preserved, and one can easily um, distinguish the half circle shape of the heating chamber. On the, oops, sorry. On the left is the small rectangular platform is attached to the oven structure. Many pieces of slag have been found here and will be sent for analysis. East of Building H, the 2018 campaign allowed us to complete the excavation of the 4th century occupation of room Q1. This room yielded a rich amount of material, coins, amphora, bases, bones, uh, in particular, they were able to complete the excavation of two small back rooms. Uh, the western one is the most interesting and contains in the northwest corner a semicircular base supporting a millstone, fragments of which were found on the ground. Uh, we are convinced that room, they are convinced that room Q1 was in fact a small house containing an upper floor. Uh, and you can see here a first reconstruction of this uh, house. South of Building Q, the excavation of the second room of Building P was conducted. They were only able to uncover parts of the latest floor, dated to the half, first half of the fourth century, as indicated by coins that were found on it. The room is very well built. The threshold is complete with lead still in place uh, in the hinge holes. The west wall is particularly well preserved, as the other internal separating walls, uh, as, as uh, its upper part was made of clay, and traces of clay blocks are preserved. Finally, it was interesting to note the discovery of a group of lead sling bullets, all bearing the inscription of IT. Uh, this discovery is of interest because it is already, we had already, they had already found 15 sling bullets bearing the same inscription on the Acropolis. And outside Argylos, only one such example is known in Greece. The team also continued the excavation of a large commercial building L, focusing on rooms L8 through 12. The main objective for much of this was to complete the excavation of the latest occupation at the 4th century levels. Little materials found on these floors, except for L11, where excavators uncovered several small transport amphora uh, crushed on the ground, as well as a large basin of material. This basin was placed over the opening of a very large pithos, and unfortunately there, was, there wasn't time to empty the inside of the storage vessel. Finally, in room L9, an exploratory trench was opened in the southeast corner of the room under the 4th century BC floor. One of the objectives of the 2018 campaign was to verify if the large uh, street uh, uncovered on the south of the uh, east slope of the hill during the early years of their work at Argulos continued southwards toward the seashore and the ancient port of the city. The results are quite spectacular. Uh, not only here you can see, not only did they find the continuation of the street, but they were able to clear it over a length of nearly 70 meters. It is in an excellent state of preservation and reaches in some places a width of nearly 8 meters. On the east side, it is bordered by four or five large buildings, the largest appearing to be the northernmost one of the side consisting of large rectangular slabs. Curiously, they expected the street to be more or less perpendicular to the HL, P, and Q complexes, but it is oblique, as you can see here. However, there seems to be a junction heading towards what could be the eastern limits of building uh, P and Q, if, as we believe, as they believe, uh, these are the same lengths as H and L, uh, as you can see here. So this is the large. In any case, the discovery of this street is extremely interesting from an urbanistic point of view, since it is probably the main avenue of the city, and it will allow us to physically connect the commercial complex to the southeast sector. And when I say us, I mean Jacques Perot and his team, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so that concludes my talk for tonight. And I would like to, again, thank my colleagues
colleagues for sending me all this information and for uh, sharing this information with you. You should also note too, my term as acting director, interim director, will be coming to an end June 30th, and Jacques Perrault will be taking over as uh, director of the Canadian Institute on July 1st. So I think we're all very lucky and fortunate to have him, have the Institute in his hands. So thank you all for your attention. <laughs>